Welcome to Santa Barbara Talks with Josh Molina. It's such a pleasure today to be here with Michael Montenegro, who is pretty awesome. I just got to say, an awesome dude in this community, somebody who is very popular around town, also very popular in social media, documenting Chicano culture, Chicano histor historian, uh, just a Santa Barbara historian and somebody who's just really fascinating. We've talked a few times. You've been on the show. I'm really excited to kind of catch up and talk about a whole bunch of stuff that you've been working on. But um, I'm really excited about this because I'm really, you know, I'm a big fan of yours and I'm really happy for the work you're doing and proud of you as a, you know, fellow Latino in this community. You're really doing the real work. So that's great. Michael, how are you doing today? Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Uh, it's a tremendous honor to be a part of your podcast again and to link up with you and and talk about Santa Barbara and Cultura and et cetera. I'm, I'm doing great. It's Friday. It's not too hot. The weekend's coming. Well, it's already here. But yeah, thank God it's Friday. So uh, yeah, I'm excited to, to give you updates, what I'm working on, stuff that I've been publishing, projects and et cetera. Perfect. Let's dive right in tomorrow on Saturday, as we record this on a Friday. On Saturday, you are going to be one of the people giving a talk. I guess it's three perceptions of Old Spanish Days Fiesta. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Some people will have a chance to see it before the actual event, but it's really something that the information it can you know they can take with them at any time and so can you talk about it what is this event what do people need to know about this chicano perspective with fiesta yeah no, I, and i'm glad that you're asking about this so the event is called three perspectives on old spanish days and uh yes it's uh it's happening tomorrow 10 a.m free family friendly uh, we're going to have uh, speakers of uh, Eric Hugh Davis, who was the 2022, or I believe 2020, um, El Presidente of, of Old Spanish Days organization. Uh, we're going to have Spencer Jaimes, who's, uh, who is a cultural practitioner and of the actual, of the of the Santa Barbara Chumash tribe, the Shumuik, um, of this actual land of Santa Barbara. So we're going to get his Chumash perspective on this uh, local holiday festivity and then I'm going to be the third speaker and I you know me as being a local historian Chicano uh someone of Mexican heritage I'll be talking about old Spanish days from that perspective and this is actually um I'm co-hosting it but I'm also part of this organization called uh Santa Barbara uh, neighbor walks. Um, we'll share the flyer in the video for those who want to check it out. And essentially, it's an organization of great community uh, members, leaders who want to uh, bring awareness to certain neighborhoods around the Santa Barbara area. Um, tomorrow, it's the the downtown touching on the the topic of of old Spanish days. Uh, in August 26, I'll I'll give you more information as well. Uh, August 26 is going to be about uh the the past, present, and future of uh, Lucumbre, uh mm -hmm. Plaza and that of that neighborhood. And uh, as you might know, they're going to build seven uh, a seven story building, a condo building, and uh, it's going to definitely um address the need of more housing in Santa Barbara, but also um. It's going to definitely uh, change the fabric of the neighborhood. So uh, it's going to be of some controversy, but we want to bring community members in and uh, have that healthy discussion by the city council members, developers, the owners of the building, and, and just the, the neighborhood as well to, to, to participate in this. So a uh, very healthy uh conversations, invaluable information, and just uh just having that organic uh connection of 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 who makes up what makes up uh Lucumbre neighborhood. So yeah, more information about that. And uh, to go back about my event uh that's happening tomorrow, three perspectives on old Spanish days. Essentially um it is a hour and a half 
walk where we start at the Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara Historical Museum. And um, we start off there. We go to the second location, the Presidio, and then the third location, the courthouse. And each location is going to have different speakers. And uh, we're going to talk about old Spanish days from, from our different perspectives. So uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be stimulating and uh, definitely promise to, to um, broaden your horizon of what is old Spanish days in Santa Barbara, also known as fiestas, as you know. Yeah. So let me ask you a question, because as we know, Fiesta is like this huge community event. It draws in people from out of town and everybody, most people, you know, they love it. They enjoy it. They take part in it, uh, whether it's uh, the dancing part of it, whether it's yeah. uh, just uh, eating food, whether it's just sort of partying downtown or there's official events you can go to. There, there's all kinds of different levels and layers that people can participate in. Um, but sometimes, you know, this thing comes up. It's like, why are we celebrating Spanish, uh, you know, colonization of Native Americans, you know? And there are some people who get really uh, concerned about that, upset about that. And mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times, it's like, if you look at, like, the Dignitarios event and all of these um, formal events that Old Spanish Days puts on, it is a lot of white men and women who are in cowboy suits, and it's it's... You know, if you're not from here, you can kind of take a look at it and be like, what is this? So can you talk? I mean, how are we as Mexican-Americans, as Chicanos, uh, how, you know, how do we feel good about celebrating old Spanish days? Is mm -hmm. it something to get worked up on or is, is, does it have a whole new meaning now? What's your take on it? Yeah, great question, Josh. And I would just start off saying that whether you're, if, whether you're a tourist visitor you recently just moved to Santa Barbara or a lifelong resident. Um, everyone's entitled to to have their position or like their feelings uh, on this local holiday. Some people, uh, for some locals, they they run to the hills. They avoid downtown. They, they it's an opportunity to travel out. Uh, for other folks, this is where families come together. Where um, when it comes to folklorico, the flamenco dancing, where these kids work really, really hard um, to be great dancing performers, uh, to 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 create a, a fantastic show, and this is where families, parents, children, uh, relatives, um, people who admire the the culture, the dance, to 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 appreciate and look forward to it. Uh, and there's other folks who are more on the neutral side, where it's like. They see it more as Santa Barbara fiestas. They mm -hmm. can look past the the I would say the the corporate dominant narrative of like, oh, it's ritzy, it's it's Eurocentric, um, it's like Pearl Chase status, like for the Santa Barbara Lee or anywhere else in the world, or yeah, the world country mm -hmm. to come to Santa Barbara. Um, so it's it's just there's just that's why I'm doing this event. There's just so many ways to experience this and just hear different views. Like for me personally, yeah. um, I see it, you know, as a community heritage advocate. Um, from that perspective, I I see it more of Santa Barbara tradition, Santa yeah. Barbara heritage, and uh, of course, I'm not going to dismiss or romanticize the Spanish past. Um, of the bloody conquest, the enslavement, the genocide of the of the Spanish Empire, the injustices when this was Mexico, uh, the injustices of uh, when this was uh, became um, uh, American United States, um, and I could go on and on. Uh, history, as you know, is uh, could be quite bloody and, and invoke a lot of uh trauma bad memories uh you know if you're if the one if a person is like on the perspective of decolonizing um yeah i can see why they would despise the holiday if it's someone who is of mexican heritage and they don't see it in that perspective it, it's an it's an opportunity to be like wow like this is my culture like this is where like everyone in santa barbara 
wants to be Mexican for that one week. I always say that um, old Spanish days, fiestas, is is the week where everyone wants to be Mexican. Where it's uh, we're we're already cool, but <laughs> they want to be they want to be cool with us. That's the week that they where everyone in, in Santa Barbara is more pro Mexican, more pro uh, Latin uh, Hispanic culture. So uh, it's a great showcase. Um, and then for the folks, uh, for more of the of the corporate dominant narrative, um, I definitely see the value of um, of how important this holiday is to our local economy, especially in downtown. How I used to work in downtown uh, at several uh, businesses, and I could share with you that so many businesses depend on this big week, where this is the week that keeps them afloat for for months ahead. So this is something that's very uh, important to our local economy. Um, and it's also uh, tied into the Santa Barbara brand. So I don't want to see it erased. I personally would love to see it rebranded. I, I spoke to past presidentes from old Spanish days. Um, I definitely see how there is a lack of diversity type of issue. Uh, I could understand how to even be part of the leadership, you have to almost like pay to play, where pay to be a member, years of volunteering. And then after that, you get nominated, you know, whether to be president or director or, or historian or whatever. So uh, that's where it becomes more uh, elitist. Where like, shoot, I personally would love to be part of old Spanish days organization, but I don't have the means to pay the member charge or or the bandwidth to go to all these meetings. Um, so yeah, that's my position on the on our local holiday, and I I would definitely like share that when it comes to this holiday, um. My favorite thing about fiestas is uh, los cascarones, the the confetti eggs. I personally uh, grew up making them and selling them as a little kid mm -hmm. <laughs> on State Street, and mm -hmm. um, I love that aspect. I love the families. I love the dancing. Mm -hmm. um, I, in particular, I love the 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 carnival, the fair at the Guadalupe Church. You know, for the folks who are uh, listen watching this listening and watching this uh if you really want to have that real santa barbara local experience of course you could go to downtown pay like 50 bucks for cover and whatever uh you know ten dollar beers or what you know etc whatever but if you really want to have a local experience you want to see what the locals are doing i highly recommend going to the guadalupe parish church the catholic church on the east side and they do uh, uh, old Spanish days, fiestas, carnival. And that's where you'll see what Santa Barbara is all about with our local tradition. Yeah, Our Lady of Guadalupe, the, the, I, it's, it's such an interesting thing because there's so many levels of how people celebrate fiestas, right? Yes. There's stuff that all the media covers, myself included. It's the, it's the big events. It's the press releases from old Spanish days. And of course, it's all the dancing. There's so many young people who grow up in the dance system, and it's such a such a important event. But then, you know, the church carnival is where locals go, and uh, especially we're not going to have the other one. It used to be at Mackenzie Park, not even at City College now. So, if you're looking for that family experience, it's really going to be the only option with those kids. You know, I grew up going to fiesta and um i used to make cascarones with my uh grandma you know and, and, and draining the egg and, or saving the egg and you know drying it out and then decorating it and saving and all year that's a way to make money a little yes. bit of money on the side and uh we still have that tradition so i'm kind of conflicted because i really love that part of it too 
I get annoyed when the city of Santa Barbara sort of tries to crack down a little bit on it. It's like saying it's litter and all this, and they have evolved like the kind of stuff you can put in the egg, which of course is good, but it's like a culture clash between the environmentalists who did not grow up in that tradition. And they just see it as like weird junk. And other people see it as like, this is a way that you bonded. You grew up with your, your family, you know, like uh, cutting nopales or something, you know, with your yes. or grandfather, it's like the same kind of thing. So, um you know for me it's sort of like well you change the meaning right it's it is you make it is what you make it and fiesta's fun you know and it's it's so cool to be down there you see john palmentary you know he's mr fiesta with you know and, and all of the egg vendors and uh it's like a really cool thing so you pick and choose what you what you do but i know a lot of people locals just get out of town during fiesta too yeah <laughs> just, i don't blame them more power to them. <laughs> Hey, let me ask you, um, Michael, about you. Um, you have this super popular Instagram page, and you are a local historian, and people know you on site. You're an alternative transportation advocate. You're an activist in the community and a historian. What is your goal with Chicano Culture SB? What is it that you're trying to do? Because I have to say, it's not really just something for Mexican Americans or Chicanos. It's, it's really history. It's just a form of history that is not celebrated as much as other forms. But everybody should be interested in what you're doing. So, can you can you talk about what your what your goals are? Yeah, absolutely, and uh, uh, more than happy to. Uh, so. When it comes to my work, you know, specifically with Chicano Culture SB, um, since we last spoke, um, my thing with Chicano Culture SB, uh, just to share the mission statement of my project, you call it almost like a nonprofit, but I no one else runs it besides me. No one pays me. I just do it on on the mere merit of 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 a natural duty to serve our community and and provide uh, representation and and also just as a when it comes to Santa Barbara's diversity, there's just so many different pies elements that make up the fabric of of Santa Barbara. So uh, that's what drives me to to do this work. Um, I'm just a person that cares. At the end of the day, I just really love our culture. So with now doing this work for 10 years, I will definitely say I'm proud of what I've accomplished. I've been doing my annual Santa Barbara mural bike ride event where I promote local uh, history and public art. I've uh, been doing it for free and family friendly every November, every first Saturday in November. Uh, I use my own resources, time, energy to to organize this um, this event. Um, I do other events like Cinco de Mayo, part of Cycle Mania, promoting cycling in, in Santa Barbara County, um, and also just to represent the Cinco de Mayo history of Santa Barbara because we've been celebrating Cinco de Mile in Santa Barbara for over a century. So it's, uh, I always tell people, uh, Cinco de Mile is a American holiday that was created by Mexican Americans. So, um, so yeah, I do events. I write articles. I, I do archiving. Uh, I make videos. I make documentaries. Um, I produce, I collaborate with people. Um, so when it comes to the future, I just want to continue doing what I do, do it at a higher caliber. Um, I want to become more sustainable since I'm using my own resources, apply for more grants. And ultimately, um, just keep on writing. I want to do a a a book since I, I could pretty much write a book with all the posts that i've written i'm sure that could all be compiled and be like dude you pretty much have a book mm -hmm. but as you know compiling organizing producing a book is uh takes a lot of effort and energy and resources so um i definitely want to go about this uh efficiently and wise uh get the proper support 
and do it uh in a, doing it in a really official historical type of way. Um, I besides a book, one of my next events um that I'm planning on organizing is a event that revolves around uh Santa Barbara lowrider history. I've actually technically did a short overview about Santa Barbara lowrider history at one of my past events where I, I featured Los Tranquilos, an up and coming uh, soul band, like Latin soul band from Santa Maria who are blowing up where I had them featured. I was the opener as in I did a small uh, presentation and uh, it was very well uh, received. I even had uh, leaders from the lowrider community attend. It was, and it was just really beautiful to make them proud. Uh, so I want to do that same concept, that same presentation, bring it out to 45 minutes, uh, which shouldn't be no problem since we, we're just so rich in lowrider history in Santa Barbara. And then also give a lifetime achievement award to a fellow uh, Chicano photojournalist named Jimmy Fuerta. Um, for some of y'all might know him, uh, he runs his page called 805 Breaking News. He used to uh, be a photojournalist for uh, the radio stations, uh, Radio Bronco. He would do corresponding events when there's accidents back in the 80s and 90s. And um, he actually was um, published in the first volume of uh, Lowrider magazine. So when you see Santa Barbara mentioned anywhere in Lowrider magazine from the first volume, first two volumes, is a very high chance you're going to see the name Jimmy Huerta. Uh, Jimmy Huerta um, actually also knew Sony Madrid, who is the founder of Lowrider magazine. So he, he is from that era, that late 60s, early 70s of, of Chicano Renaissance. So um, he's now in his late 60s, and I want to give him the flower the flowers that he deserves and the recognition while he's alive and um so and and, and part of that event uh, i'll be also uh organizing a small exhibit on local uh lowrider history like in in the in the means of like artifacts of like past outfits awards pictures uh magazines that we've been published in and uh, have some photos printed and such and such. So uh, I do plan to have it uh, perhaps in like the next six months to a year. Um, I want to make sure it's properly uh, produced, supported, and just make sure I invite uh, all the right people, um, make it equitable, you know, actually have, you know, kids, neighborhood, like folks from the community, to to be a part of this because this is um history that I, I want to 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 make to to empower our, our our community members. So yeah, be on the lookout. Santa Barbara Low Rider History event. I'll have the flyer, more information in the future. So yeah, besides that, keep on making my content, keep on writing articles, um getting published in different, you know, sites like i as you might know i've been publishing la times this past october oh yeah you um, had that big story with you did the walk with the journalist there yeah mm -hmm. yes yes okay. it was an it was an incredible incredible opportunity um uh, the journalist just reached out to me on my website and introduced him introduced himself we started talking i was kind of skeptical at first and then i looked up his name and and uh, he essentially reached out to me after the 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 the, the drama scandal of the the former law professor who made racist uh a mark a uh, racist uh, oh remarks. the cell phone video at the property yeah yes yes so um he the journalist um he was just very curious of what is Santa Barbara? Like Santa Barbara has this reputation of, you know, of wine and luxury and the American Riviera. However, he was just very surprised at uh, this type of 
incident would would occur in 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 our cities. So he reached out to me. I gave him a, a introduction. I uh, linked him up with my friend James Joyce, Coffee with a Black Guy, because I definitely wanted to uh, provide the journalists um, uh, more diverse a perspective of of the Santa Barbara experience when it comes to being you know BIPOC people of color here in Santa Barbara. So um, I gave him a tour. I gave him a tour, and I I gave him the Anthony Bourdain experience. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I always tell people that like I Anthony Bourdain is my idol and he's one of the reasons what uh, the reasons why I do this work so I gave him the tour uh, a few weeks later it got published in paper it was on the front page on the California section um, my friend was playing handball and like the photo there and it, I saw myself and it was just really, really well written uh, for everyone who are who's watching and listening to this. Just type in like Santa Barbara Latino or Santa Barbara Michael Montenegro LA Times and you'll see the article right there. And um, I even got really good um, feedback, uh, really kind of remarks from uh, Nick Welsh, who was another journalist in town, and uh, he was actually really impressed. And he said that usually when LA Times uh, speaks about Santa Barbara, they always run the same narratives as in, you know, American Riviera elite, some kind of scandal or, or superficial, something like that. And uh, he, he said it was a very fresh breath of air. So, yeah, that's what I've been doing. And I just want to keep on doing this work at a higher caliber. Yeah, that was that was really significant. That story. It's so funny because the the like visit Santa Barbara and the tourism agencies, you know, they always talk about a certain type of Santa Barbara, right? But we all know that that's not Santa Barbara. That's just a fraction of it. Real Santa Barbara is the kind of stuff you document and what you explained to the journalist. And remind me his name. Do you remember his name? The LA Times reporter. Um... Let me and we'll remember it before before we because I remember seeing and I love that photo where um I think um you, you took him to like some place like a, a bar or restaurant or something like that. Yeah, it was produced by um Tyrone Beeson and okay. uh he's a, I don't know if y'all can see it, but yeah. um it's very good. Check it out. He's, yeah. yeah, he's a great writer. So what is it to be a Chicano, Michael? Um there, you know, we've made a lot of progress. There's less overt racism. Like, no, mm -hmm. very few people are going to come up to you and I or somebody who looks Mexican and insult them, right? That's That doesn't happen as much. It does happen still. But very, it, it's not as overt as the 70s, the 80s, right? Yes. But there's systemic racism. There's different kind of racism. It's like, we'll help you, but we're only going to help you insofar as you don't compete with us or you don't mess things up mm -hmm. um and and there's a lot of misunderstanding about who's who people think all latinos are all from mexico or all from the same country and we're very diverse what is a chicano can you explain to the audience your definition of a chicano absolutely so in my opinion a chicano is someone is um who has a historical conscious mindset um and it's also it, i would just say in there's different versions of the definition um i relate to all of them so i'll say it uh so there's that definition the second one would be it's simply just someone of mexican uh, heritage living in the united states um once you cross that border whether uh, you just migrated yesterday, or you've been here since you were born, you bet your parents migrated, or you've been here when the border crossed you, or or um, you're of the Spanish California families, or whatever. The point is, uh, it's someone of, of Mexican heritage living in the United States. It's another way to say Mexican-American. Um, and with those two definitions... It's the political mindset of being like historically conscious. Uh, it's a chosen identity. So uh, in a way, it's more of like a right of of uh, a privilege to be like, oh, are you really Chicano? Tell me 
tell me what's up. How tell me your your position. Uh, tell me about your stance and your understanding of culture and history. Um, there's that type of uh, activist definition of of of, of being Chicano. Uh, and that word the, the word Chicano for the people out there, it's been used in like specifically in California for like over a hundred years. So it's a very well documented uh title of 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 uh, of 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 culture. So with that perspective, going now to more of the uh cultural, socio-cultural uh perspective, um as you might know, Josh, um when it comes to being Hispanic in the United States or Latino, Latinx, uh Latin, uh we're over like 63 65 majority of of uh, united states uh, latinos latinas latinx uh, are of mexican heritage we're in the millions we're more than like luxembourg uh hmm. more than like countries like fiji or new zealand um we have such a huge uh buying power market buying power uh we're so distinct that um that we deserve the proper recognition we deserve our our own self determination to tell our own stories and 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 et cetera so um the social capital of of our culture of being chicano chicana is so distinct that you wouldn't want to call someone uh, in Miami a Chicano or re reference a, a Latin scene or activity of, oh, that's Chicano. Like, what are you talking about? Like, mm -hmm. and they, they don't really identify as being Chicano in like in Miami, Florida. It's right. more of a Cuban, Puerto Rican, South American uh, heritage over there. But when it comes to being Chicano over here in the Southwest, including Chicago, um, and other cities that have high uh, percentages of, of of raza of folks of Mexican heritage, um, we're so distinct that like let me give you some examples. Like we have lowriders, something that's so iconic and internationally known. Uh, we have uh, rich, delicious food that you know you could maybe reference it as like Tex-Mex. Some people call it, you know, Californian food, um, Mexican American food, but like our food is so distinct that it's, yeah, it is of Mexican influence. Yes, it has that Mexican foundation, but they're, but our food, the way we cook it, like chimichangas and our elaborate burritos and other uh, dishes, they're not found in Mexico. So, um, so. With that, with those factors, there's there's famous artists out there. Like locally, we have Sad Boy Loco, uh, Santa Barbara uh, rapper who's toured internationally. Uh, we have uh, artists uh, like actors like Mario uh, Lopez, who was on Saved by the Bell. Is he uh, from Santa Barbara? No, no, he's not. But I'm just, oh, I'm yeah, just yeah, yeah, okay. Um, Slater, I, I, yeah, he was he, he's definitely one of my role models, but I have to admit, I like Zach also, so yeah, Zach's cool, <laughs> but yeah, I just want to share that. That, um, there's actors, there's directors, there's artists, politicians, um, uh, corporate leaders, community members, teachers, you know, police officers, etc., who are of this heritage, and uh we're we're so huge that you can't ignore us and um so yeah and that's what chicano means to me yeah yeah it's so important i love how you uh do historical photos you know you've run some of my family and you do people all throughout the community and there's something special about like you see another mexican-american chicano family in a photo and you don't you may not know them, but you know them. Like you were in the, you did the same thing they did. They did the same thing you did. And you could put yourself right in that place and understand it. And it's just a culture that here, you know, we, we know we grew up in and it's how we experience Santa Barbara and Galita and Carp or, you know, even Santa Maria. It just like, there's a certain way we live that 
is different than the same people who live in these areas just in different parts of town so i often find myself just kind of like getting lost in some of those photos you know and i'm like do i know this person or i know somebody who knows this person and because i grew up here and sometimes you know you're just like whoa that's that person you know i remember that you know so it's so it's so cool your work with the low riding community and your history can you just talk a second about what does that mean to be a low rider? I think a lot of people think of the cars, obviously, the souped up cars, the fancy cars, the hydraulics, mm -hmm. the cruising. They might have an image of what a low rider is. Um, what, what, why is that so important to Santa Barbara's history? Can you just kind of briefly talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when it comes to low riding, um, I think this is definitely best. Um, Especially like shown through my 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 articles. Like for example, I did a spread, uh, a cultural spread for Santa Bar magazine uh, with uh, the culture issue. It had Michael Keaton on the on the uh, on the cover, so it was an incredible uh, opportunity to write that. Uh, and then right there, I organized uh, a, a pretty much a lowrider photo shoot where we had like at least over like three million dollars of uh, of uh, of classic automobiles with its rare parts, rims, hydraulics, et cetera. So um, I, the reason why I'm so passionate when, for our low riding community is because we make Santa Barbara rich especially when it comes to a tourism perspective. I even documented this uh, in one of my video reels in, in, in Instagram um, where there was a cruise, uh, a caravan cruise conducted by Clique, a, a, a car club. And it was like seeing magic. As someone who's an avid observer in uh, of just, just people watching our community and all that, it was so special to see tourists whoop out their smartphones, their DSLRs, and just be in complete awe where they're visiting our community, putting money back in our economy, letting, our, letting the world know how beautiful Santa Barbara is, but they have that experience, that um, the experience of seeing a, an incredible sight where it's like, oh my gosh, I saw, I finally saw a lowrider in person. Uh, I've seen lowriders in, in music videos and movies and magazines and commercials, but I never seen one in person. Um, it's, and so from that tourism perspective, like that's why it's so important for me to humanize lowriding in Santa Barbara, uh, in the eighties and nineties, it was very demonized, um, where even our, even our own city and, and the state created like low rider, um, cruising, like anti-cruising ordinances, the state, the statewide one has been, uh, repealed. Um, and they're still working on, uh, on, um, taking down other anti-cruising ordinances that, that, um, that target, uh, low rider owners. Um, so I'm from that history, that perception of like, oh, they're the cholos or gangsters and all that. And that's the opposite to be a low rider owner, uh, is not a cheap hobby. Hmm. It is not cheap. These are hardworking people, men, women, families who put a lot of love and energy and resources to maintaining their low riders and it's um it, it's just it's just santa barbara community it's santa barbara culture so my thing is like i want to humanize i want to put our culture low riders i, I want to give them the recognition that they deserve so and i just want to educate people of of like non Chicano heritage to be like, yo, like this is beautiful. This makes our city 
awesome. Like the other day, I just I referred like three of my lowrider club um friends of oh, organization car clubs to the the car show at the mission to Santa Bar Mission. And um so it's Santa Barbara. <laughs> So, Michael, tell me about yourself. Uh, Where did you grow up? How did you become an activist? Um, I know your dad. Uh, I see you on social media very proudly with your daughter. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about your background and um, how you got involved in all this? Yeah, I'd love to. So I'm first generation. My parents migrated here uh, in the late 70s. Um, I remember my first act of activism was during the the prop 187 days um where there was this call of action to bring to take out all your kids whether you're of mexican heritage or not take them out of the public schools to uh to make an impact that like hey you need us for for tax purposes to get funding for for the schools so i remember that call of action and my parents taking me to la casa de la raza I remember going there as a little kid, a little boy. I was like only like eight years old and learning about our culture, learning about La Casa de la Raza. I remember Ross Castro, a local uh, legend um, who's no longer with us, but I remember him speaking to us. Uh, I remember me, Manuel and Zueta. Um, and that was my first activist experience. Um, and then from there, I, um, I, how do you say, school happens, public school, I mean, it's local schools here, um, and when I was 19, I went to San Barbara City College, and I took my first class of on Chicano studies called uh, Mexican American art history yeah. by the local legend uh, Manuel Unzueta, uh, muralist professor, uh, just uh, a, a, an icon leader here in Santa Barbara. So um, he was the reason what really empowered me to like remove the fish scales from my eyes to see and feel. Uh, proud about our culture and to give back and 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 I've always had a big heart I still do I'm just a person that cares mm -hmm. so um ever since then I, I just try to get involved you know whether it was uh police brutality um something unjust with the school district something just with um like I was really involved with like the back in the mid 2010s where uh, the city tried to uh, propose a a um, the gang injunction, mm -hmm. and that gang injunction took years, years of deliberation of of uh, should it be passed or not, and um, me and community members. It took the whole community. Uh, it was it wasn't just me and my friends, my my activist friends, my, um, but it took everyone uh, to get involved and. And to speak up about how the gang injunction was uh, just an unjust uh, thing and how Santa Barbara doesn't need that. Um, so from there, um, I I just care. Like in my recent, uh, the last time I spoke to you was about Ortega Park uh -huh. and about this the historical and cultural significance of the park. Um, I mentioned to you that how the outdoor theater is actually dedicated to Ruben Salazar, uh, a Chicano journalist of the LA Times who was uh, murdered uh, during the Chicano moratorium, where our local community, uh, Brown Berets and June Brown Berets and others, went to that historical event in uh, East LA. So um, I just want to bring that kind of um, attention, awareness, I used to be more direct, just to, to say the least, with my activism. But I realize when it comes to systemic change um, and the work I do, I, I was just asked a lot what, of like, why do you care so much? Why does this matter? And of course, for me as a historian, someone as a local, 
um, I, I personally knew, but they didn't. So that's when I realized like, hey, I need to instill historical consciousness to our community members, to uh, people from across the country internationally that um, that this matters. This park matters. Our people matter. Our culture, our art, uh, our people matter. So, yeah, I, I just that's why I shifted more to being like, yeah, I guess I could be considered an activist, but I would consider myself more of a like more like an advocate in a way. So that's why I shifted more to being a historian, a community heritage advocate, um, just someone who speaks up about um, um, social issues, who look out for the uh, for the Hispanic community, the immigrant community. Um, I'm only one person. I, I just try my best. I encourage people. I try to empower people to share their voice. Um, I tell people like when, when folks romanticize the activism from back in the day, I'm just like, dude, you don't need to travel back in time. You can do that today. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's what I do. And been doing it for 10 years plus. And yeah, I'm a parent. I have a daughter. Who I love dearly my world. Um, and Besides work and my projects and being a you know a, a dad, I do co-parenting. So um, and also just also prioritizing joy because uh, I have experienced burnout before, and you know working like 70, 80 hour weeks. And when you work that much, uh, you know, and you don't prioritize joy or you know self-care decompressing uh, and all that it just takes a toll on you so um i just want to go about this work in, in a very sustainable way and know my limits pick my battles um choose my causes get back when i can you know i'm a human i i get tired i get lazy i sometimes i just don't want to do anything and there's other weekends that I'm supercharged, you know, I have things super planned and et cetera. So I just do the best I can do. Mm -hmm. Like tomorrow, you're going to be super planned for sure. <laughs> yes. Um, I want to just talk just a second about one of the things you said, um, you know, about making a difference, being an advocate or an activist, people of color, and I'll speak specifically as a Mexican American, not for other people of color, but um, as a Mexican American, you know, um, it can be tough. Like you have to, my perspective, my perspective of making change is if you go in there with what you have in your heart, your fire, your anger, your frustration, and you approach the system to change it, people push back. They, they say you're angry. They call you names. You're not part of the solution. You're a troublemaker. So I believe you have to infiltrate. And by infiltrate, I mean, you got to figure out how to get in and make change that way. Because if you don't, you're always butting heads. And even now, occasionally, like real Josh will come out, you know, like my journalism stuff, you know, trying to get a story, scoop, get someone to talk to me. I'm put, they're pushing back, I'm pushing back. And I kind of have to, you know, be kind of like, be a little authentic, you know, like, no, you, this is wrong, you know, and I have to do the journalism, the lecture thing. And people like kind of get surprised, right? And they're like, whoa, this guy, he's used to be nice. Now he's not being nice. And you have to straddle that line, especially when you're trying to make inroads into systems that are dominated by, you know, white, white um, privilege and, um, yeah people who have historically had power in the community. Yes. How do you navigate that? I would imagine, Michael, that there are people who love you, but then there are people who are like, oh no, there's Michael again. Um, what are we going to do? What are we gonna, how are we going to respond to him? Um, and they may not feel that way about some other kind of historian in town, you know, so like a Pearl Chase type of historian. So can you talk like about that? How do you navigate those worlds when you get pushback, when people... Maybe you don't want to give you the respect initially you deserve. Very good question. 
Well, it took a lot of experience and I'm now 33. So I definitely lived it as in with a burning heart. I still consider myself having a burning heart, a flaming hot heart. I'm a very passionate person. If I, if I believe in something like you, you'll authentically see it. Um, so yeah, I've experienced the clashing of heads. I've been excluded from events. Uh, I've had the whole Gucci face, microaggressions, like the whole room or a whole group of people just look at me and I'm just like, I don't care. <laughs> um, um, but I would say in a way I have naturally become more in a way conservative in a certain degree um in a way that's more wiser as in like i i know better not to go all gung ho in in the certain spaces um you know i understand the importance of uh decorum and and etiquette and uh the place time the people the audience so um I guess I know my code switching, my language. Um, um, I've become wiser where I know how to say it in the, in the preferred language. I have become more professional. Um, my vocabulary, my, my, my etiquette has certainly improved since I was, you know, since I was like 24, 25. Mm -hmm. Um a deeper understanding of uh, local government and how things work um, when it comes to uh, decision makers and um, political leaders. Um, like the last week, uh, I attended the, the, the Sentinel uh, Fiesta party and I spoke to the uh, Presidente of, of this year of old Spanish days. I spoke to Randy uh, Rouse, our mayor. I spoke to other leaders. Uh, I spoke to like one of, I consider him like a, like a mentor, uh, Neil Graffy, who I consider like the Santa Barbara historian. Like a lot of my work or my foundation, my work was based on his, on his research, but I just told it from a Chicano perspective and uh, pro tip, pro wisdom for all the his, aspiring historians out there always give credit where it's due you know we always we you always gotta uh we when it comes to being a historian you know we 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 look into these sources uh the people's published works and we kind of take it as our own but it's just super super important to always pay credit so i'm a big fan of his work tom uh maduro um the galita historian I'm, forgive me, I'm butchering butchering your last name and also. Moduno, yeah, he's Maduro. a he's. He, I just he just sold Santa Cruz markets, and I just I just talked to him recently. Yeah. So there you go. Um. So I, I I just I'm just wiser now. I'm more mature. You know, I'm trying to do do this for the long game. Um. Yeah. I I just just want to go about things in a more wise, mature efficient way yeah a lot of experience because chicano culture sb is your side i mean not to say side because it's full-time but you don't get paid for that it's you have an other job where you get paid so you are it's really a love and a passion and obviously you're doing your best to to uh you know make it more financially sustainable for you but that's a lot a lot of work that that you're doing you uh recently wrote a story for the independent on blessed and uh you know it's just there's the thing i love about santa barbara you know and i was a little jealous of you because like i'm i i grew up here and i've worked most of my career here early 20s um left for a while came back but I really pride myself on being someone who remembers things that happened more than like five years ago, because <laughs> I, you know, I've been around. And so I feel like I serve that role. Uh, Nick Welsh, uh, as a journalist, serves that role. 
Uh, but we, you know, we, we remember different things. Sometimes it's the same thing. Sometimes it's different things. And when you did that story, I was like, mm -hmm. oh, I know that guy. Like I saw that guy all the time and I never went up to him, which of course that's always a regret, right? Like you think people are going to be around forever. You never approach them. Then they're not, but I'm like, oh my goodness, who was that guy? And then you wrote about it, but you didn't just like write about him you did research you went and found family and you dug up info and and you wrote a story you know and so that's very journalistic like you know it's a first person sort of account but it's it's very journalistic and I love that I just think that's so cool because it's the kind of thing that I would have loved to have done also is 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 and I still could but like just that drive and initiative to tell somebody's story and I'm sure you got a ton of feedback because he's one of these people everybody saw. But tell me about Blessed and why you did that and who was that guy? Yeah, and, and thank you for for bringing that up. Yes, it is. Uh, it did get published this week in the paper. Uh, you'll see it in in the bottom of the front page. We Jesus. That was his one of his other nicknames. Uh, so. It just the story just came about where it came in my news feed and on Facebook and it was how do you say like a blow as in like wow he's like this this pillar this icon is now no longer uh walking with us uh today and his legacy deserves to be remembered and uh get the uh, attention that it deserves so I started off with this meme uh it's not necessarily like a meme about him but like it was like a photo and um you know i put in the text like we jesus you know also known as ikuma osaro i'm butchering his name but i went from there and um i, I also include a photo with him and his daughter suki and uh it went viral it went viral as in that post i think right now it has i believe it now has 7000 uh likes and it's reached over uh 74000 people and people from all around the country the world engaged in in, in this post so um this gentleman known as blessed that's what he identified as uh he was a, a man of spirit um and i personally didn't know him but i just know him from my observations and my friends accounts so from there i i just started logging drafting up a piece of like what people were saying constructing it making it you know in, in that format um the independent reached out to me they they noticed that this viral is going viral this post is going viral and they asked me to um if i would write a piece about him so i said yes and um i worked with gene yamahura uh, apologies yamahura. I, uh -huh. yes <laughs> apologies if i butcher your, your your name but she was very supportive she helped me um get more information uh suki uh blessed uh daughter uh reached out to the independent and was able to provide more information so it was a very collaborative uh, uh piece that i'm really proud of and um an honor to have it in paper and um i also made like a graphic um that was in that uh post uh well not in that post in, in the in the paper and then in the independent paper um like a collage like a like a like a saint because he was he was a man of god he loved jesus so um put the cross put like a red halo to re to represent his japanese heritage and uh long story short i was able to meet his daughter uh this past sunday and it was just just an incredible uh privilege to to connect with her and just pay respect and she she really appreciated the the, the kind words i wrote about him and what i compiled and um and i'm really proud that she you know went home with my my collage piece on about his about her father so um yeah it's it's just, it's just that drive josh i i like i said um 
recently, like when I'm proud of something, when I'm passionate about something, it's authentic. If I think something is cool, someone is cool, what they're doing is cool, that's rad, whether cool, rad, awesome, amazing, noteworthy, whatever, you know, tomato, tomato, semantic words. Um, I just love to recognize it. And that's why part of my my page, Chicano Culture SB, I like to uplift artists who deserve more attention, leaders who are doing great work. Um, so I guess in a way that's a kind of like promotion, um, you know, validating these people, putting them on a on a pedestal and be like, yo, this person's awesome. Check them out. Check out their work. Check out their art. Check out their music. Check out their 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 activism. So yeah, that's just that's just how I go. That's it's like a natural intuition. Yeah, that's great. And you you chronicled a little bit of that history with with Blessed and I mean he gave up his worldly possessions, moved to Santa Barbara. And that was that guy he used to just see walk around, you know. And I think the lesson there is, you know, if you see someone like that a few times, go up to them, you know, and just be like, hey, you know, introduce yourself, maybe learn a little bit about them because now they're gone, you know. And and we see that with um, with time, just uh, being able to document history, write these yes. biographies of these individuals as they are no longer no longer with us. Well, Michael, I want to wrap up there. I really appreciate your time and uh, sharing everything that you do. It's really uh, notable and uh, recognizable. And you are, um, you know, as important as anyone you write about. You're a hero in so many ways by documenting this history. You know, we don't have the news press archives anymore. Maybe someday we'll get them back. Um, there's a lot of history there, a lot of Latinos, yes. a lot of Ch Chicanos. There's a lot of people of color who've been written about over the years. And, you know, what you're doing, it takes on even bigger importance because um, we need people to not just worry about today, but also worry, you know, remember how we got here. And that's, I think, what what you do. So good luck to you and everything. And uh, thank you, by the way, for, um, you know, what you do for my work. Whenever you promote it, I always appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I might see you tomorrow. So uh, at the uh, the event, take some more pictures of you like I did at Ortega Park. So. Yes, I, I, I'm, <laughs> really, I'm really honored. I hope to see you there. Uh, and thank you for your kind words and the opportunity to be a part of your podcast. I'm a big fan of your work. I've always... I remember like seeing you like way back in the day. I was just like, all right, that guy's a Latino journalist. And then years passed and I got to meet you more and more. And uh, I'm proud to say that uh, that I know Josh Molina. And uh, yeah, you do fantastic work too, Josh. So keep up the great work. And, uh, and uh, if you ever need anything Chicano related, uh, I'm at your service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I greatly appreciate that. Okay, have a great day, Michael. Good luck with everything. We'll talk soon. I'll see you soon. Thank you. All right, later. Bye-bye.